uh, today we have a long list of uh, persons including uh, president chair convener and the list of some panelists so first of all i would like to invite professor y vimla president of this session and uh, pro vice chancellor of this university please welcome ma'am in the session and uh, chair professor rajiv washne from ikri set i welcome you sir and the convener of this uh, session professor pk gupta ji and it is professor in this university i also welcome sir please join and we have four panelists in this session dr andreas from australia dr parvinder from australia sorry dr andreas from greece dr parvinder from australia dr tara from jodhpur india and dr tanushree from icdv india new delhi and now i hand over the floor to our convener professor gupta ji sir please thank you sachin it's a great pleasure to be here in this concluding session this particular conference today's conference has been a feast we enjoyed all the lectures there were 10 excellent lectures in which we had the opportunity of listening learning and uh, i know that i still have to follow on with some of the speakers because everything i heard i did not understand but nevertheless you see the title of this particular conference was that we are looking for agricultural research in the post gen covid 19 era and we did not talk much about it and i think there is not much to to talk about because the research will go on as usual it seems but two or three points which i very briefly like to mention and uh, i should tell the chair dr ajay varshne i am very pleased to see him he has brought name and fame to our university and uh, he will be handling the whole session but i will briefly give my comments so that he doesn't have to invite me again you see in the post genomic era one of the major problem which came to my mind is that we have not talked about the post harvest technology which has been a problem the storage of the produce which we produce and therefore we should also discuss or propose that some research in the post harvest technology should also be done and then the second point which i like to mention is that plants are being used for development of techniques or proteins for detection of covid and then also for development of vaccines and also for drugs therefore i wondered whether some of the plant breeders can take initiative to develop crops which will provide immunogenicity to the human beings along with nutritional content if we can develop crops where the crops will have a higher content of the protein which will develop immunogenicity that is another area which comes to my mind but uh, other than this during covid we also realized that uh, there was problem of human resource research scholars could not attend to the lab and the machines in the lab sometimes may go out of order so these are other aspects human resource availability and the machines in the lab they should keep on working in this connection and uh, in this conference we have talked about the data generation data management and data utilization you see in this era where we have enormous data available if we have the lockdown you should be able to keep on doing your research while sitting home like many other companies and they ask their workers employees to to work at home we should also be able to work at home uh, rather with with more productivity in research if the data is available and we have the expertise to utilize this data in a very constructive manner in one of the presentation parvinder talked about compo this comparative genomics excellent presentation i have to follow her to follow with her because some of the things i did not understand in her lecture she talked about hic which remind, reminds me of one of the comments on one of our papers from from abroad 
where they asked us to do chromatin interactions. You see, many large number of chromatin foldings are there within the cell and therefore transregulatory mechanisms are there. And many a times when we identify the genes or the regulatory sequences, we are unable to really identify those transregulatory sequences and the genes which are present at a very far away position, but because of the chromatin folding, they come together and are allowed to be regulated by particular sequences. This is an area which I have only recently read, but I'm sure Parvinder must be doing much more about it. And therefore, the listeners may try to understand this. Chromatin interactions or 3D conformation. There is an important paper on 3C conformation published about more than 10 years ago, and it was followed by 3C, 4C, 5C, and IC. So this is a very important area in future research where we will try to understand the chromatin uh, conformation folding, which will brought far away sequences together and will be involved in regulatory mechanisms. Other than this, when you do data, of course, is available in, in very, very good amount now, and I am sure it is being generated at a very fast speed. So the data which is available, we are unable to really utilize it to the fully extent. And that is one area which is my concern. And one of the reasons for this is that the students and the faculty don't have the expertise which is required for full utilization. They have some expertise and the data is being utilized in a number of labs, but they don't have the full expertise available to make full use of the data. In the morning, I asked Dr. Prasanna also about artificial intelligence and machine learning. These are the two words I have been hearing for the last two, three years. I don't fully understand it. I listened to a lecture where one of the seed companies, two engineers, developed an approach where they would use artificial intelligence. Take a photograph of the plant and from that picture, they will generate a lot of information. So that is one very important area, artificial intelligence and machine learning. I do not know how soon uh, our students and our faculty will be able to equip themselves with these two important areas of research in agriculture. That is very, very important. And the facilities for this. You see, Parvinder told us that what could be done in years could be done in a few seconds with the supercomputers. But these supercomputers are not available everywhere, particularly in India. And then even if they are available, we don't have the expertise to make use of this particular facility in a big way. And that is one very important area we should receive our attention. The supercomputer should be made available and the expertise should be available where the students and the teachers should be able to develop the software and coding in order to make full use of the data which is available. And of course, all these different areas which I briefly mentioned will go along with conventional plant bidding. That is also we should not forget. Conventional plant bidding cannot be replaced. And the conventional plant bidding has to be supplemented by all these efforts, new area of, uh, areas of research. We are conducting some epigenetic research that has not been considered in this particular symposia. But these three conformation, conformational changes, that also we came across only when we were doing epigenetic manipulations in case of free. I will not take much time. I now hand over to Dr. Rajiv Vashne. He will introduce all the panelists. I welcome all the panelists on behalf of the university and the organizers. And because Rajiv knows every, every panelist, I would like him to introduce each one of them and continue the proceedings of this panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gupta, for very for setting the scene. And I also feel very honored to chair this session, especially when Professor Gupta is there, Professor Bimla Madam is there. So I really feel very uh, privileged to participate in this session. And uh, Professor Gupta has already given very nice background about that session. So we will not take much time in that one, but I would like to introduce quickly our panelists. And I'm very pleased to see that we have really a very impressive list of the panelists and also they are great friends because we just planned the session or speakers only yesterday. And when we contacted those 
friends, they quickly accepted. Otherwise, I know that they are always busy people. So in this list, uh, I think I can mention, start to introduce and I not in any order of preference or so, but just randomly. So Professor Andreas Volodakis and he is uh, from coming from the Inu Athens University of Agriculture from Greece. In addition to his expertise on the molecular biology and virology, pathology in many aspects, he right now, he is a project in coordinator or principal investigator for one big project of European Union. And we call that project ADAPTNET in short, but then that uh, idea of that project is to strengthening research and training of national partners, especially in India for developing climate change ready crops. And I think Andreas will talk further. So we welcome you Andreas. Thank you very much for joining us. I would like to introduce you to Dr. Tara Satyavati. Dr. Tara Satyavati is an eminent breeder and very, very forward looking science leader. And right now, she is the project coordinator for All India Coordinated Research Project on Pearl Millet. She is based in Jodhpur. And she is one of those important science leaders from ICR, Indian Council of Agriculture Research. Since Madam has taken the reins of this Acre Pearl Millet, she has brought a lot of changes. And she will share some of her views that how she has made nutrition as integral part of the Pearl Millet breeding. Now I would like to introduce, so welcome madam, thank you very much for joining us. Now I would like to introduce you Dr. Tanushri Kaur and she is eminent leader in the area of genome technology, gene editing, etc. She is leading several projects on gene editing and the emphasis of her research work is on to undertake these new technology of molecular biology, especially gene editing for taking care of the nutritional aspects of the different crop. And she is coming from the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, ICGV, from Delhi. Thank you very much, Tanushri, for joining us. Now I would like to mention about Dr. Parvinder Kaur. And she has already been introduced yesterday. And even today, Professor Gupta mentioned her name several times. So I don't think that I need to introduce her further. But nevertheless, she has been again a great friend. She is coming from the University of Western Australia. And she has been working on the frontline technology in the plant genetics. And recently, she has been, uh, she has started a new project. And she is the director for the DNA Jew Australia, where she is working with several colleagues. And basically, idea is to work in the area of development of the genome assemblies for endangered animal species, etc. She has also been working on the human nutrition aspect. So she is well known for the different uh, components. So thanks Parvinder for joining us. And uh, I think these are the panelists and Professor Bimla, uh, Madam, we already have, uh, I think Sachin already introduced. She is a leader at that uh, CCS University in Meerut and she is the pro vice chancellor and we are always having great support from you, Madam. Thank you very much for joining us and you are the presidential chair of this session. Professor Gupta, he already introduced and I do not need to introduce him. him. He is my teacher and I learned all this ABC of molecular biology of genomics from him. I worked with him for about five years and I'm having long association from 95 onwards. So I know my wife less than I know Professor Gupta. So this is that relationship I'm having and he is my well-wisher and my basically mentor for the last, I think, 25 years or so. Thank you very much, sir, for blessing me every Hello. time. And I'm always ha I'm also happy to see Professor H S Valyan, my teacher, and many other friends, including Professor P K Sharma, Shalendra Sharma, Shalendra Gaurav, and uh, Sachin Rahul, Dharmendra, many colleagues. So I cannot mention all the names, and I know that many friends they have joined from all different places. Right now, we already have the list of about 280 participants. Mm -hmm. So what we will do in this session that we will be asking each panelist to share their views for five to 10 minutes. We do not need to have the PowerPoint presentation. We already have been listening these PowerPoints from different colleagues. So what we will do that we will be discussing these some of these things. And then after that, we will open the session for that uh, questions from the audience. And uh, Professor Gupta already mentioned about the different areas and he is well known figure in the plant genetics and breeding. So he, he talked a lot about the different areas, but very quickly, Professor Gupta, it will be really good for the young generation 
to have some of your views that how do you think that this genomics and post genome sequencing technology as you mentioned several of these related to high c technology different and uh, new technology that how they are going to play important role in crop improvement so we will be very happy to have your uh, Thanks, guidance sir. on this aspect please Thanks, i thought you will not invite me again because i i made my comments but nevertheless since you are specifically asking me on genomics and new next generation sequencing these are two very powerful technologies there is no doubt about that and the data being generated by both these technologies genomics and next generation sequencing is enormous and we cannot really fully utilize this data we should equip ourselves to make full use of this data data generation and data management and data utilization i mentioned in my initial remarks so this is an area which is really a remarkable area and we know reference genomes of a large number of species many of our students in the bioinformatics lab they just sit down on the computer take the gene sequencing of rice for example and utilize it for asking for detecting and identification of of genes in case of wheat for example so bioinformatics is growing and every genetics department and every plant breeding department should have a bioinformatics component it is absolutely necessary in case of rajiv washne he has full department therefore he doesn't have to equip himself he, he has a big support but at a places like ours we need support of bioinformatics so that this data can be fully utilized you see many of our students can utilize this data blasting etc they can do they can do the search similarity they can find out but they cannot do coding whenever there is a problem most of our students are deficient in making codes and write a program to solve a problem which is not really very difficult it seems we have a postdoc who does it very successfully but in majority of students don't have the expertise therefore this is one area which i think including yeah. genomics we we want to use the reference genomes we want mm -hmm. to use the next generation sequencing data and therefore in order to make use of this data we should be capable of using bioinformatics in a in a very productive productive manner and once we have that equipment equip ourselves then of course um, there is no limit there is no limit to the utilization large number of genes we can have large number of genes can be sequenced we can develop sequences of important genes and find out whether a particular snp is responsible for the phenotype and if we know that one single snp is responsible for a particular phenotype you can use base editing okay it is a modified form of crispr cas where you know that we have, we want to change cytosine to guanine and therefore you will develop a program and the equipment which will allow you to do that adenine to guanine so there are so powerful techniques this technique of base editing i am very fond of talking about it it was yeah. developed for the first time in 2016 but during the last 4 years enormous progress has been made in this area uh, only day before yesterday there was a new paper fast crispr cas where it will be done at a very very fast speed so these are the areas which should uh, attract the attention of the young young plant breeders or young geneticists so that they can make full use of and the the field of genomics and next generation sequencing and as i told you earlier also there is no yeah. limit yeah this technology we can develop yeah. and as i told earlier also dr prasanna this lecture uh, and earlier yesterday also we have to support the conventional plant breeding we have to prepare ourselves both the other three areas conventional plant breeding then transgenics and then this genome editing which is different than really development of transgenics so Very gmos good. may may not be immediately acceptable but G, the other the editing technique and the conventional plant breeding and marker assisted selection these yeah. are the areas but the markers will come you see through through exercise of utilizing the data thank you rajiv
Thank you very much, sir. So I think this was really very important point. And again, to all the colleagues who are participating in this session, they can take the notes of these their questions, and then we will open these questions. We will enable the chat box after having all these perspectives from the panelists. So please keep on taking the question. So what I understand that basically Professor Gupta wanted to highlight two three points. One is that we need to have this integration of the different technologies, and second is as he mentioned that I think I cannot emphasize further anymore. and i call this area basically analytical and decision support tools so once you have these sequencing data or so we need to work in this area so that we can basically analyze and based on this analysis we can provide the decision that what we should be using in the breeding program or so and this is one of the important area so like this upstream science people should work with these crop improvement folks and then that interface should be analytical and decision support tools thank you very much now when professor gupta mentioned about this one area second is that related to that one as he mentioned we also talk a lot about the transgenic but somehow because of number of regions and because of this uh, guidelines or so in many countries we could not see the products coming in that uh, field in some cases this was successful but nowadays lot of emphasis is going in the gene editing today morning as yan gaudbin has presented that even australia they already have made the guideline that gene editing through sdn1 technology will not be regulated india they are making those guidelines we will see that what comes out but at this stage i would like to ask tanushri what do you think tanushri that future of gene editing or gm or also in in combination of these guidelines for the release of the gene edited products tanushri please yeah good afternoon uh... all the seniors and colleagues friends thank you rajiv for giving me this opportunity to talk about this uh, very crucial aspect which needs to be uh, given more attention at this uh, post covid stage because now uh, as we have already known that cross breeding mutation breeding and transgenic breeding are being can we see her on the full screen yeah i can see so uh, Pre currently, the uh, the three uh, technologies, the cross breeding, mutation breeding, as well as transgenic breeding, have been employed for uh, crop improvement. But uh, uh, these uh, have uh, been labeled as the, the the first, second, and third generation uh, technologies. And amongst these, the cross breeding and the mutation breeding are really um, hard. Uh, in, Uh, uh hard work intensive like lot of work needs to ma'am you need Dr. to Tanushri, unmute yourself you are muted you need to un unmute yourself yeah now it's fine okay what i said was this uh, currently the cross breeding mutation breeding and transgenic breeding technologies have been employed for crop improvement however amongst these cross breeding and uh, mutation breeding technologies have been uh, time consuming and a lot of effort has been required although these conventional technologies are required but in the post covid uh, era now the government and the, and the scientists together should uh, sit together and develop a platform where this genome editing technology can be uh integrated with this conventional uh, mutation or uh, uh, cross breeding technology so that we can introduce or reconstruct the diversity of uh, or diversity in in the genes and alleles as we know that uh, in the in the past uh, <clears throat> lot of uh, uh, genetic diversity decreases or uh, plateaus have been attained due to this uh, continuous breeding of Uh, cross breeding or mutation breeding so we which is quite uh, which is quite time consuming but anyhow if it is uh, complemented with genome editing wherein we introduce uh, an, uh, mutations which are precise targeted and uh, specific in the genome without introducing the any ext extraneous materials or any antibiotic genes or any back backbone of vector backbones and this this technology thus thus can improve and complement this Uh, uh, crop breeding technology, uh, 
and it can be labeled as a precision design agriculture wherein it can be integrated through deep exploration of on crop functional genomics popular precision editing technologies which dr gupta just mentioned that includes uh, the latest technologies of editing that is base editing which in and and there is an a latest uh, uh, approach that has been come up which is called the prime editing wherein not only can you uh, change the bases from c to t or t to c or an a to g and g to c you can introduce eight different transversions like c to a g to t any any kind of transversions that are possible like eight of them can be introduced through prime editing wherein you do not need to create double strand breaks also you just need to have a uh, a, a small nick in 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 the uh, genome which uh, employs a uh, um, a cas nick case cas9 which creates a small nick and it searches the region that needs to be cut or which needs to be replaced and it is replaced through an rt a reverse transcriptase which is which which is uh, it is a domain that is uh, fused to the cas9 nickase domain and it replaces the undesired portion with the desired portion without creating any double strand breaks throughout the genome thereby uh, elevating of target effects so this is what i would i am trying to do in my lab you, you, utilizing this latest uh, technology which has been uh, developed in the in american lab uh, i forget the name of the scientist with the paper called anzalone et al 2019 october 21st it was released so this can be employed in plants also we have developed developed this platform for uh, introducing these uh, these these uh, mutations without creating double strand breaks in the plant genomes which previously was been done through crispr cas9 and uh, and moreover i would also like to uh, suggest that these uh, sdn the simple changes uh, that lead to uh, mut uh, introduction of mutations by uh, sub uh, amino acid substitutions or frame shifts through two to three base pair changes or up to 20 base pair changes so these can be Uh, allowed to uh, uh, you know uh, forego the uh, the gmo uh, control i mean they should be considered as green as the mutational uh, the, the, the the events developed through mutational breeding or through cross breeding and it should complement that so once one uh, like we we in our lab we have developed uh, certain lines that are in increased with having increased iron and zinc content so th there we have in utilized three important genes that are uh, basically working as iron sensors and they uh, sense the iron content coming to the grain they sense that iron content and this if we stop this sensing if we stop by knocking out these three genes that are basically concerned with iron sensing then excess of iron can go into the grain and we can control or manipulate or you know uh, regulate the amount of rice that we can uh, use to eat maybe we are not in, 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 in we are not in introducing the entire uh, you know genetic content uh, we can mix it with the, um, the the white rice or whatever rice popular rice of that area but we can use it as a uh, important component so this these three ed, these three uh, ed, genes that we have edited individually and we have used multiplex editing for uh, simultaneous editing of uh, these three genes have shown great promise by increasing the iron content in the endosperm which was very low uh, previously uh, crop crop breeding and uh, uh, mutation breeding have not uh, yet uh, given us these events wherein the iron and zinc content is increased in the endosperm there are a lot of uh, varieties or accessions available where the iron content is more in the aleuron layer but when you come to the uh, fact that people are um, mainly eating white rice wherein only the endosperm content is there therein we have tried to increase the iron content by 15 to 30 ppm so this uh, has been achieved through crispr through cas9 through uh, through homologous donor repair technology and through uh, non homologous end joining technology where it repairs the in, where uh, where it creates a double strand cut and it repairs the it repairs the mutation uh, creating a mutation via 
uh, homologous donor repair as well as by we have developed through non-homologous end joining wherein you can uh, create the deletions and this these genes are as good as non-functional like uh, uh, we've created like uh, better than rna silenced lines and these lines can be used for crop breeding further and thereby removing the uh, terminology called the genome editing and making it more uh, user friendly and uh, uh, calling it crispr cas breeding technology wherein you can we can uh, within 4 to 6 years develop these uh, independent lines and give it to the breeders where with and these can be used into introgression uh, can be introgressed into the elite varieties wherever in whichever area they they, they require so this is what all i wish to see and plus uh, this products can be come if if we utilize this platform as we have in icgb we have developed certain lines with increased amino acid improved amino acid profiles with uh, with increased iron and zinc content with reduced phytic acid content and also increased lycopene content so there are these several lines that we have developed if government and the scientists and the farmers to or the breeders sit together develop a platform uh, wherein these can be exchanged through uh, mutual discussions and these can be used for introgressions in the elite variety so there are several uh, uh, products that have been developed in us wherein they are already in the market like the anti browning mushrooms then there are the banana resistant banana uh, which are resistant to streak virus there are there are the wheat varieties that are now gluten uh, free or with reduced gluten there are there is a cacao plant which is which is the main plant for chocolate uh, industry that is affected by a pathogen which is called phytophthora tropicalis that has been uh, controlled by this crispr technology then we have got uh, sweeter strawberries we uh, generated virus resistant tomatoes people have also redu reduced the amylose uh, reduced or increased the amylose content the uh, potiva has reduced the amylopectin content in maize so there are so many things we can do we can also utilize this technology for creating bio factories in plants where you can yeah. in increase the uh, metabolite content by the crispr uh, technology so this Very is nice. in short in short i would uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity but this is what thank i would thank yeah. you Thank you very much, Tanushree, for highlighting the importance of the technology and also ongoing research on this aspect in your lab and around the world. And as you mentioned, that now especially these mutations coming from the HDN one should not have been a problem. Let's hope like this kind of thing and keep on doing good work. And you already mentioned several examples, so I think that this is the area which is going to be very important. But for that, even today morning, Ian Godwin also mentioned. that for doing these things we really need to have really the gene for those particular traits so this is also important that we need to keep on doing the discovery research on that aspect you also mentioned about this iron and zinc about in the rice that this in the aluminum layer and yeah many times so you are working on this aspect so and now when we are talking about the post covid 19 and even during the covid 19 era we are having this issue that low immunity not having really good nutrition so the population which is not having the good nutrition this is having much more vulnerability for this virus exposure etc because somehow immunity they are directly or indirectly related that one and in this regard i would like to invite dr tara satyavati who is doing really good work on the nutrition aspect and we would like to hear from dr tara that what is her view how the crop improvement should be moving some of our own experience and some of our directions for the future dr tara please thank you dr raju first of all i would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my views on the work we are carrying out and uh, for the past uh, two days i have been uh, listening to the lectures the lectures are really good Uh, for world class quality and the excellent uh, information has been provided by all the lectures all the uh, speakers so coming to the topic what uh, dr rajiv has asked me to speak now is related to plant breeding with nutrition uh today and yesterday we heard many many of the latest developments in uh, different fields related to genetics genetic engineering genome editing all these things in spite of all these advances at the end of the day we try to bring all these technologies into a single variety or in a number of varieties and when 
we think of breeding the varieties as a plant breeder we try to incorporate as many as number of traits as possible without any loss to the yield now we all know that uh, in the recent uh, one decade or so people have started speaking about biofortification and they have started to address the hidden hunger just now rati has mentioned about immunity even before that also professor gupta has mentioned about the immunity and during this covid 19 crisis we have seen what role immunity plays and to have better immunity we should have good health and it comes from better nutrition and it has been observed that in most of the countries especially the underdeveloped countries more focus is on filling the stomach and trying to get number of calories but not much attention has been paid to have good nutritious food which would be rich in vitamins and micronutrients which are real boosters of immunity and health in humans and animals now if you see now i'm trying to speak from the indian perspective in uh, india stands 102nd rank 100 out of 112 countries which have uh, been ranked the global hunger index and that is a very difficult situation for us and the main reason with, uh, for this is the hidden hunger the child mortality and the main culprits for this hidden hunger are iron and zinc malnutrition though we are trying to feed our uh, population with good amount of food but we are lacking to provide them with the wide amount of micronutrients like iron zinc and then also vitamin a so efforts have been made by scientists to incorporate these things in the breeding and that's so we have seen the genesis of golden rice then higher in uh, beans higher in cassava sweet, uh, orange colored sweet potato higher in pearl millets all these things. now coming to high iron pearl millet because i am uh, now heading uh, this uh, project coordinating unit uh, all india coordinated research project on pearl millet what we have done is uh, we to means for the past 10 years research has been done on development of high iron lines high zinc lines in pearl millet and we are having some separate trials to have uh, to identify with the high iron millets but as a breeder we also focus on developing high yielding lines when as a coordinator when i see what are the varieties of the hybrids which i have to promote i would see the first preference would be yield then this is resistance and all these things but where does this nutrient content stand if we breed bacterials or the varieties with high iron separate before the takers in the market we do not have a separate or segregation in the market that yes this is the high iron material or this is the low iron material we do not have a segregation not the consumer is aware of that this is the iron rich material or this is the zinc rich material not the grower knows what is the difference between high iron material or the low iron so in order to avoid this confusion but also to give the benefit of this science and technology which has been developed so we thought that we should bring this nutrition aspect also into consideration when we promote the variety so that is how what we have done is if you all know that in the uh, all india coordinated research uh, projects we have a three tier system of testing of the varieties the first year the initial trial we test the varieties all over the country in different groups then based on the performance of these we pick out those varieties for the entries which are performing suitable to different agroecologies and then we go for the advanced trial where we test for two years in different locations with multi location testing and over years so apart from this yield parameters and this is resistance and other resistance parameters we much of iron content in our whole minute we have said that 
iron content should be minimum of 40 to 80 m. Any material, irrespective of whether it is high yielding or highly resistant, no way. If, if it has a minimum of 40 to 80 m iron and 30 to 80 m zinc, then only the entries will be promoted for the next year of testing. And also, they will be identified after the three years of testing for release. And even at the least proposal release time also, it will be again checked that yes, these are having this much of iron energy. So, this way we try to bring the nutritional trait as one of the criterion for identification and use of the material. So, by this, we have incorporated, we brought the nutrition aspect along with the yield. That is how today pearl millet is the first crop of its kind, not only in India, anywhere in the world, to have nutritional quality traits as one of the parameters considered for promotion and release of particles. And uh, this is how uh, we have started. And this calls for rationalization and change in the right we start breeding the material. So all the breeding programs are now directed and they've been encouraged to develop high iron dish material along with all the other parameters which we are already looking for. And a rigorous phenotyping is being done. And thanks to Ikrisat, uh, we have a good collaboration with Ikrisat, Harvest Press and other programs. And all the material is being phenotyped, and that is how we are able to get good chunk of material with iron energy. And this is how uh, this iron pearl millet story has come into. And because millets are rich in nutrition, and they are already named as nutrition cereals by Government of India in uh, March 2018. And these iron dish pearl millets are being uh, taken in the middle meal schemes and ICD schemes and they are given to children for uh, increasing the iron content because in India we have this problem of anemia for the young girls, ladies, lactating women and uh, pregnant ladies. So to meet this we need to have something which is easily available, something which goes along with the staple food. Uh, they need not go for uh, buying some tablets or something like that, not everyone can afford to it. So that is the reason we have for, uh, we came up with this idea and right now it is working well. And if you happen to go to Dr. Rajiv's lab, he will also give you a chikki made of um, pearl millet and sesame and uh, jaggery because many people have started uh, understanding and uh, many work, uh, researches uh, have, have been uh, conducted and most uh, many outcomes are yet to be published. But yes, this is the developing time and the people have started thinking in a new direction that such things can be done. And similar types of things are uh, happening and maybe in future we can see in rice and many other crops. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. This was very nice, madam, that uh, you have highlighted the role of this breeding, especially for the nutrition related aspect. This is going to be very, very important. And now when we are talking nutrition, I thought that we can also discuss a bit about this climate change related issue. So nutrition is important, but now as we anticipate the adverse impact of climate change issues on agriculture. So in this aspect, I would like to invite Andreas to share his views that what he thinks on this aspect and how he thinks that through capacity building or through research that these kind of issues can be addressed. So, Andreas, please share your views on this aspect. Okay. First of all, thank you, Rajiv. You hear me? Yes, yes. Very well. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I would like to say a few things, first of all, about the, the, the European project that uh, uh, I'm heading. It's called, uh, as Rajiv mentioned, it's called ADAPTNET. It's a European funded project where uh, four institutions from India and four institutions in, in EU, two in Greece and two in Italy are collaborating. Uh, basically, this, uh, this project um, doesn't fund research directly. 
but indirectly through mobilization of uh, uh, staff, students, uh, in uh, one direction, uh, in, uh, that means from India to, to Europe. This is the second project I'm, I'm heading. The first one was uh, uh, between 2013 and 2017. It was a four-year project where we mobilized about 107 uh, Indian people to, uh, to Europe to be educated. That was a larger uh, project than the one that uh, currently is running, and actually it's halfway uh, done. Uh, it, it will last from 2018 to 2021, and uh, it has, as Rajiv mentioned, the, the, the point of climate change, okay, because now the, the climate change is hitting us, and uh, we need to adapt, or plants need to adapt. We have to make plants adapting into climate change conditions. Uh, I would like to stress what Professor Gupta said that, okay, that uh, crossbreeding will do not disappear. That, that will uh, forever be there. My point is that all the new technologies, breeding technologies, will speed up cross-breeding. So the young people should be educated uh, into methods of cross-breeding and in methods of molecular breeding in order to make things go faster. Faster, why? Because the human population grows fast and climate change will hit us. So we, we have two things to face, okay? More mouths and uh, uh, the environment hitting us. Now, COVID-19, I believe, will slow down the number of mouths, okay? Because I think human population will not run so fast after COVID-19. One more important thing is that European Union has to make a decision because a majority of projects are dealing with mobilities. Uh, the one project we have is uh, EU India, but there are a great number of other projects with uh, all different parts of the world. So EU with all different parts of the world in order to mobilize individuals, staff, or students, postdocs, etc., in, in for educational purposes. Okay, education includes also research. Okay, so now we are halfway to AdaptNet project, and uh, we have finished one big pillar uh, who uh, uh, we propose, and that was the the development and implementation of workshops four different workshops in uh, three Euro European partners, and also the last one was held in Iqlisat. So in that, in that uh, pillar, we mobilized 29 Indians uh, that were educated through these four different workshops. And that is uh, actually completed in February 2020. And again, the main issue was uh, uh, climate change and uh, how climate change will will affect the uh, uh, the, the the crop production uh, from different aspects, from a meteorological point of view, from the crop production, from uh, the, the genomic approach on how to uh, make or collect information uh, in order to to uh, uh, speed breed uh, crops. And uh, now we are, as I said, we are in halfway of AdaptNet, and the, uh, the second pillar of this uh, mobility uh, format that AdaptNet has is the mobilization of 16 Indians, 16 PhD students that will come and join the labs in Europe for a three-month period. So this, this will give these 16 uh, PhD students the ability to learn in this three-month period uh, different techniques and contribute to uh, in-house in EU lab uh, uh, research. Uh, now, 
I think this is all about uh, adaptnet and how we uh, we proceed in this project. Uh, as I said, this is my second uh, EU Indian project through um, through EASEA, which is the funding uh, agency. But uh, I think because I'm 100% proficient in uh, getting funds through this scheme, I'm planning to to do one more. Uh, uh, maybe starting next year. So whoever is interested, uh, maybe uh, can contact me or 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 Rajiv. Now, a couple of things that I would like to point out is that uh, from a breeding point of view, we have new breeding technologies. Uh, we have uh, speed plant breeding, and this is very important. And uh, us in the plant kingdom, we should be very proud of having such a, a methodology. Uh, if we compare to the animal kingdom, where I think uh, speed animal breeding uh, will, uh, will be delayed. Uh, I have to stress that phenotyping will be, it is and will be very, very important and uh, as a, a, another omic technology and then st statistics doing correlation between genomic data uh, metabolomic data proteomic data will have to link with phenotyping data so i see a very big opening to bioinformaticians and statisticians in in crop uh, production uh, uh, in the future one other thing that I would like to mention is that GMOs are not welcomed. But what about if we add an E in front of GMO, so epigenetic GMO? Uh, I think, in my mind, this is one way to avoid uh, this big hurdle of that um, a lot of countries and, and Europe actually has posed in uh, refusing GMO uh, plants to be planted in uh, European soil and, and other country soil. So I think that the epigenetic modified organisms uh, will be the solution in the future. Okay, so the, the, my idea, because I'm thinking of how to approach this, uh, this issue, is how we can externally induce epigenetic modifications at will. So this is uh, uh, where I'm, I'm thinking a lot. Uh, I, I have good data to as targets of epigenetic modifications, at least in, uh, in the pathosystem that I'm, I'm working more, which is tomato and, and uh, TYLCV, tomato yellow leaf curl virus. And uh, I'm, I'm planning to, to uh, move towards this direction, meaning to modify epigenetically susceptibility genes of tomato against this particular virus. Okay. We know that the presence of viruses modifies epigenetically the genome of the host. So this is done naturally. The point is now how we can learn how nature does things and copy it, as we have continuously done over the years. And I think uh, here is where I'm going to stop. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are. Yeah, thank you very much, Andreas, for highlighting that climate change related issues and also the very important area about this epigenetic GMOs and I know that you already started working in tomato. So I think this is another new technology in addition to other technology which we were talking. Thank you very much for sharing the really very exciting ideas. Now I would like to invite Parvinder and when I ask about Parvinder I am always confused that for which area I should be asking her to give her feedback or suggestions because she got so vast experience in so many system so this is really very important that she is basically learning from the different system from the different technologies so we really feel very excited to have her here so Parvinder I will leave this thing on you that which particular area would like to talk but uh, yeah so thanks a lot and please floor is yours thank you Rajiv thank you so much for the kind introduction and everybody uh, or especially the organizing committee 
Um, I would like to really congratulate you guys for the, all the hard work you put in and bringing in such a such a wisdom together in the last two days. It's I have been not able to attend all the lectures, but most of the lectures I've attended. It's been really an honor to be participating in this today. Um, and yes, Rajiv, uh, that is what exactly I would like to talk about. Uh, and that was the key reason um, being multidisciplinary or break the barriers. Uh, if you, that was the reason I gave my talk that title, Breaking Barriers. It is really important uh, to look at things uh, as problems or solving those problems, in my opinion, rather than look, the, look at them as a disciplinary sort of a thing. And this was the key reason that when I did my agricultural honors degree from Plant Agricultural University back in India, uh, I was looking for a plant protection experience because I, I really wanted to solve the challenge of insect pest, but also the diseases at the same time. And I got introduced to this concept of like how we divide, you know, this is plant pathology, this is entomology, um, this is plant breeding, this is genetics, and they all sit in different sort of boxes. Um, and I found that a little limiting, uh, to be honest, because when you're trying to solve a problem, the problem could engage many different disciplines. And I think learning science without strict discipline borders really encourages a lot of creativity. It teaches us problem solving in real life. It teaches us ethics, you know, it teaches us collaboration. And these are not the skills which are required just for agricultural people, but also for any, any sort of uh, career uh, anybody would want to pursue in a lifetime. So that, that is the first, um, first thing I would like to bring to you all you know, you guys are, we have a pro vice chancellor of the university here. We have many big people who are kind of designing the curriculum or designing how the teaching is done. I think we need to really start breaking these barriers and we need to relax it a little bit. And when we talk about technological advancements, I mean, look at how many wonderful things we are able to do these days. You know, this gene editing, uh, we are able to do this in a non-GMO way now in cereals, like for example, in wheat, they are doing RNP delivery. DuPont is doing that. So with that, you, it's not a GMO, it's a GMO free approach. It's DNA free. You're not introducing any foreign DNA into the, into the species. So you cannot regulate that as a transgenic. And that is one of the key reasons that Australia and New Zealand has taken this ground that anything where you're not introducing a, a foreign DNA, you do not regulate that as a GMO. So the, these, all these areas uh, are happening or are made possible for all the technological advancements. For example, the big data analysis, the genomic analysis, and especially Rajiv, your group has always inspired me, your work, how you have done, uh, made all those species which were never known to the world, like they have become the model species. Other species, other people are looking to use them as the models for their work. So this, this is what, you know, the power you give to a species when you bring it to that class or that kind of technological empowerment. And when you do that, I think it's really important uh, not to forget our traditional strengths or the strengths. For example, as ancient civilization like India, I think the biggest strength we've got there is our germplasm, is the biodiversity there. I had the opportunity to visit uh, NBPGR. I had the opportunity to visit the germplasm resources, which ICRISAT, um, you know, protects and harbors and and look after. These are the real strengths because domestication has done a bit of a bottleneck in terms of the traits or the or the you know, the different genes we are looking for. And this is where we need to go back to, to all those germplasm resources, to start looking for novel genes for this kind of climate which we are facing these days. And, and all the new things which are coming our way. For example, even for COVID, we need to go and look into the bats or the wild species, which has, which has lived with these viruses always, but never got a disease like coronavirus, like we are, or, you know, we are facing. So I think there is nature, nature has, all the answers, we just need to look into the right, right sources. And when I say the sources, I think India has, India has been blessed with those. There's a lot there which need to be mined and which need to be brought to, the, brought to attention to the young people. 
you know, the next generation we have. We need to get them excited about agriculture. Agriculture is no more just about, you know, going, planting plants in the field or, you know, how we used to see this 20 years back. It's completely changed. It's so exciting. I mean, we, we work on supercomputers. Who would, I didn't, I never thought that, you know, when I was doing an agriculture honors degree, that I'll be working on a supercomputer, analyzing the data of my species. I'll be able to like so precisely edit a plant and you know give it characteristics I would like to give, uh, or how it's 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 become it's it's very um, it's very fascinating field. And having worked in the biomedical sciences with the human species as well, I learned that how advanced science, agricultural plant scientists or plant geneticists are doing. Human species, I mean, it's a diploid, twenty six chromosomes, you know fully nutted out, there's like, it's really nicely done. But plant species, think about wheat, three genomes, A, B, D, you know, club there, polyploides, tetraploides, all these things, it's so complex. So it's, it's, it's fascinating for a scientist to be working with such complex, uh, you know, species, which we get to work with. So I think all these things we need to we need to bring it out. We need to say this in our curriculums. We need to say this to our youngsters. We need to get them excited about agricultural sciences in a different way so that we can cross fertilize all the talent we have got there in programming and coding, like Dr. Gupta said. Uh, you know, we, we have very good bioinformatics and mathematics come naturally to Indians, I think. They're really good at it. Uh, why can't we, we kind of bring them uh, into the agricultural cohorts and get them excited to build those new programs, to build those codes, to be able to do some exciting stuff in the agriculture. So, um, for example, I mean, new technologies, if you talk about, we are now, I talked about isoflavones yesterday. And as we identified the candidate genes in the isoflavonoids, now we are actually using yeast as a biofactory to be able to harness you know, and remove the clover plant completely because it's so hard to grow them and, and then extract the special one isoflavone or formanonitin out of them. So this is very exciting era, I think. We, we all need to feel uh, that we're living in this era and we are able to do this. But I think this message needs to go out there to the next generation. And you guys are doing that beautifully right now. I can see more than 300 people joined here. A lot of them are PhD students, master's students, and they are hearing all these wonderful talks. And I think uh, they, they might be having a lot of dreams to be able to do that. So, uh, so I would like to end with the thing that yes, we are in this era where there is COVID, where there's bushfires in Australia, you know, all sorts of natural calamities we are facing. But having said that, nature has given us a lot of strengths and we need to go and look back into those strengths. We need to start training our next generation, working with the conventional breeder hand in hand, but also learn coding from a computer science student. We need to cross fertilize these people. We need to urgently change our curriculums and how we do uh, prepare our next generation for doing these sciences. So that's that's kind of the message I would like to bring to the table today. I I'm, I'm, I I hope you guys will agree with me in that space. Thank you so much. It's been thank a pleasure connecting to all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Parvinder, for very nice views. But uh, I think you have covered all these different areas very nicely. Only thing is that I was thinking that uh, you and myself also belong to the next generation, but. It seems you don't want to consider us in the next generation. So that's not really a very good thing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, good. So I think- I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to say that, Rajiv. <laughs> you always so think of me. You the old person now, no problem. This is also good to have that come in the scene. I don't consider me the next generation. I think I've, I've, like we are really looking forward to them to good. sort of take it to the- Very good. Place. So jokes apart, again, thank you very much all panelists for very, very good views, good suggestions.